we'd work through our um, sort of plan to a certain degree and then we'd run into a couple of steep hills that we had to back off or the people that we were trying to work with backed off. And uh, it, it was a sort of consolidation period. We got our heads around it. And very fortunately, <coughs> um, because as I've said here, a large part of the Eidfell station business was the value the, of our Seneca Trudas breeding herd. Uh, we'd been fortunate to be designated Seneca Trudas stud number two, King Ranch was stud one. So when they opted out of the business, we were the longest then on going um, individual breeder. And so there was a value in that from a, from a breed, uh, not so much as a beef, point of view but from a breed point of view which did have value and we'd spent a lot of time building on that um, and there was a heritage value in the property. Eidfell Station was the first property <coughs> uh, selected in the North Burnet and it had only had three, uh, sorry, two, two sets of owners, the Archers who selected the place and they sold to the Ivory Brothers and then the Ivory Brothers did too much hunting and fishing and took their eye off the wall in bad seasons, I think. They went bit belly up and a mortgagee company took the property over and, and the Joyce family, well it was Joyce and Person that <coughs> bought the property um, from the mortgagee company in 1905. So um, our family had been there and we'd, we'd spent a lot of time building on the brand and, um, and maintaining the old original homestead still there and uh, there's th actually three progressive, four progressive stages of architecture that are on the property still as, as, um, as structurally sound buildings. Um, so there was a certain degree of value in that. Um, <clears throat> anybody that wanted to maybe look a little outside the square and think there could be some uh, rural tourism potential in that, it did have that value. And, I certainly wasn't interested in that because you've got to bow and scrape to too many people that you mightn't like too much. <laughs> My son I thought he'd do it for a while, but I just said, <clears throat> you be careful. You, you know, if you're going to have many people here, you've got to build the right infrastructure. And if you get sick of it, how saleable is that? Unless you find the right person. But <clears throat> the potential was there. And, and Rick and Alice Green, of who we had been dealing with, um, had those, the, the things that I've just mentioned, had some real value to them. They wanted to add on to their uh, Seneca Trudis breeding enterprise. They had heritage buildings on their own properties. Um, they, their family background was if they bought a property, they didn't do it up and sell it and move on. They wanted to hang on there and then build on that. And so that, <coughs> they came to us then and said, look, we really have done our figures again and we'd like to take the challenge and see if we can work something out um, that can stretch over a period and uh, leave us with an end, end deal that um, is going to keep you and Sally happy and keep us happy. And <clears throat> our, our three kids um, had decided that they didn't, while they loved it, they didn't want to run run the property with the, those sort of factors in mind. Um, so if they took it on, they'd have put managers on probably and a lot of that value wouldn't have been realised. Uh, so it was good when Rick and Alice came back um, to do it and <clears throat> once we f they decided they'd go again, then it was about setting a, a, a properly structured plan in, pro in, in process and, and getting it signed off on. Um, and because of the size of our enterprise, and it wasn't big by some standards, but it was big within the area we were moving, uh, <coughs> it was too big for somebody to, to just say, right, here's the dollars, see you. Um, so it had to be a planned sort of stage takeover. And, and the, we asked them then, you know, we're flexible, can you put some propositions on the table to us? And, and we'll work through those together and see if we can make it work. Um, and <clears throat> the whole plan that they put to us and suited us was that um, to get the finance together and to get their grounding, they needed to, to, to work the property to a, 
um, as a state thing so they could be starting to earn income from it that they could put into the purchase price or the, the lease prices. And <coughs> so the plan that they put to us was that um, they'd lease our breeding cattle herd. And that was basically the stud herd and the grading up herd that, that we were using and lease it over a period of four years um, but with a staged uh, purchase at, each, at the end of the, each 12 month. And while, I don't know whether John or Gordon was talking about having prepayments, we were um, flexible enough to let the greenups um, on their lease of the, the cattle um, that they'd be paying on a quarterly deal. Um, so they didn't have to pay a full year in front, they paid up at the end of the first quarter, they paid for that quarter back pay and <coughs> things. And to, to arrange at the, the lease value, um, we, we had to ag agree on a, on a sale price of the, 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 the stud herd. And, and that wasn't easy. It, it, it meant involving a lot of trust and, and respect for bo both sides of the party because um, if you're selling a lot of registered stud breeders, understandably, some of, some of them might be worth several thousand dollars and some might only be worth fifteen hundred or a thousand two thousand dollars depending on their age and stage of production and quality so we had to come to an agreement as to this was the overall value if they took it in bulk the whole caboodle as it were and um, they'd have had their own value as do it and we had people look at it and give us some ballpark figures and we were able to establish um, because it was a, a big deal, we could cut the price back down, uh, <clears throat> which made it, um, and at the end of it, I'll say, you need to make people think they're getting a bargain to, to strike a deal. And um, we probably felt we were getting a bargain because it was happening, you know, in a, a formal way. Uh, we get rid of the whole uh, herd as one thing, and, and I really wanted to, that herd to stay together because our whole breeding program was based on a, on a, a, um, a genetic base that we, we could move forward, keep knocking the bottom off it and trying to move it forward. And, and the best way that could ha happen for the betterment of not only the Santa breed, but for the beef industry was if that unit could be held together. Um, <clears throat> so we did that. Um, and then that, that took the breeding herd. We had our trading stock, as I call them, that was bulls that we were selling, either as breeding bulls or if they didn't make that grade, they'd go to the meat works. Our steers and our surplus heifers or surplus females um, <coughs> that the greenups didn't want to take on in the deal. And the agreement was that we could hold those um, and sell them over a period of three years. Uh, in, in other words, that, that allowed us to spread the income over that time. And we were also spreading the sale of the stud herd because they were being leased. Um, the whole stud herd leased for a year and then a quarter of them were paid for. And then th the remaining three quarters were leased for another year and then another quarter paid for. So that was stretched out over a period which, um, as for a tax advantage, that was very beneficial to us and rather than having it all thrown into the pot and then then the government wants you to pay next year's provisional tax on that too and you end up with nothing. Uh, <clears throat> so that was structured into the plan. Um, to make it easier for the greenups too, they, we had the, the whole enterprise valued, they had their values in and we had our value and we actually did it together to save time and money and things rather than me going, driving around um, the properties and showing a value of what we had and this and that and all this infrastructure. They, they came the same time, bought their valuer and then those two valuers um, arrived at a f certain figure at the end of it and then we, the Greenups and, and Sally and I discussed um, the things now, quite frankly, it, it, the valuation didn't cost us a lot, but we could have done it ourselves. Um, in that 
really all the values in the long haul did, there was a little bit of adjustment at the end because the, the fellow that's valuing it for you as a seller, he's going to keep on the upper limit probably in the value from the purchase point of view, want to keep it down. And so there was a meeting in the middle. But <clears throat> in reality, while well, we felt um, we had property that was very marketable and it, it had virtually uh, very sound water on all the four separate blocks that were run. They all had all weather access, which, you know, for selling stock is, as can be used to your advantage if, <coughs> if it's been very wet a lot, a lot of areas of Queensland and market supplies cut back. If you've got saleable stock at home and you've got road access and you can get them in and perhaps get that bit of premium. Um, and so all those things were adding up in our mind, but in the long haul, the value has just put a, a value on a, a livestock unit and a round figure. And that's what I think I could have done that too. But um, anyway, we went through the exercise and, and we were able to arrive at a, a mutual thing. Now, the agreement that was eventually written in was that um, the Greenups would lease the land for the four years they were buying the breeding stock. <coughs> and they'd agreed that they would purchase the, the land at the agreed valuation that we both agreed to at the beginning of the whole deal. But as a sweetener, we allowed them to continue to lease the land for another year um, after they'd bought all the stock. So that stretched it out to the five years. Uh, <coughs> and when I say it was a sweetener, um, the money that that they were paying us as a percentage of, of lease was a lot less than they'd have been paying bank interest rate if they'd had to borrow the money. So it, it certainly, it was, an, it was an, <laughs> a no-brainer that they'd keep leasing for another year unless they had some other plan that they wanted to buy quickly and maybe flog some of it off to someone else at a higher price, which really wasn't in there. Um, initial plan anyway, so we felt co quite confident of that, about that. So at the end of, um, or having set those things on um, as the parameters, we went to um, solicitors to draw up a deal a, um, thing and, and what we arrived at in the end was um, the lease agreement. Um, it was a lease and a sublease that they were allowed if, if for some reason they didn't have enough stock, some, enough stock, they could sublease portions of the country to somebody else, but they still had to pay us what we'd agreed on for the lease. Um, <clears throat> and that, that whole deal covered the land and the cattle, uh, the lease value of the land while they were doing it and the cattle. And, um, and it was a, a fairly generous lease, lease rate on our part because we wanted it to happen. Um, and so they went along with that and that um, the, the, um, <coughs> we had some special clauses in it. Um, there was a put and call, that's a sell and a buy. At the agreed price, um, they'd signed up that they, if at the end of the deal, they had to buy at that price if we wanted, still wanted to go on with that. And at the same time, Sally and I signed up to say that we had to sell at that agreed price at the end, which gave us some surety because land prices do fluctuate. And um, in a way, when the valuation was done, I think the valuation or the land price were at a pretty reasonable level of what you could earn off the type of land we had uh, <coughs> and so what its value was. And that was probably quite a lot lower than now because of the, the way cattle prices are. But it could have been the other way too. If there'd been a cattle depression, um, the land value could have been set at a much lower level. But that put in a call option let us know that we had something <coughs> set in stone, as it were. It had been signed off and, and perhaps um, if it was going to you know, break the greenups completely, we wouldn't have ensured it. We could have, but um, you do need some compassion if you work with people closely and things. But it did give us some surety and it allowed us to tell our children that your inheritance basically is, 
is assured, assured to that level. So don't feel left out. Uh, <coughs> and then we got this whole thing set up. Um, there was uh, other things that were mentioned today that um, during the period of the leasing, um, any capital improvements on the land were to be shared in cost. And um, we used the old 80-20 rule, except that um, I think I was too generous and I said we'd carry 80% of the cost and, and they had to put up 20% up front. And that, that panned out pretty good, or w pretty well for them because when the thing got stretched out, we were carrying that 80% a lot longer than we'd originally planned probably, but however, you can't win them all. Um, our country di did have <coughs> um, quite a lot of commercial timber on it and we had freeholded all our blocks so we owned the timber and the timber was a capital asset. It wasn't a trading stock, it was a capital asset. And if you do your timber sales rightly, uh, they're counted as capital and uh, <coughs> which alleviates the tax on it a lot. Um, and <coughs> we could have, you know, they could have asked that, um, that we valued all the timber and, but that would have cost more values. Neither the Greenups nor I were really into the timber world, so you'd have to get outside valuers to do it. Um, I asked, said, look, rather than have it valued, I'd like 15 years after we sign the deal to harvest the timber. And I'll, just on a handshake, we won't butcher it. We'll just harvest what's um, commercially saleable and things. And they said, oh, that's all right. And then they came back and said, no, nah, 15 years is too long. Um, try 10. And well, we weren't going to quibble about that. It just meant that we lost some potential growth. But another five years, I might be pushing daisies too. So <laughs> it, was, it was getting it done. And uh, we finished that at the end of, la end of this last year. Uh, <clears throat> but those were the special clauses that pertain to our actual situation. And, and some of this Western country, you don't have timber. And the bit you have, you probably wish you had more of, you wish you didn't have any of. And if it's prickly acacia or something, it's not saleable and um, things. But it did, we did have quite a lot of country that, that its best value was to grow timber. Because we had a lot of spotted gum timber and ironbark timber that's great structural timber. And <coughs> um, the only fearful part was that if the greenies held sway too much, um, you mightn't have been able to sell it. But uh, there's that fact that a lot of the people that are so-called very green love timber furniture, love timber floors in their houses and, and where else do they get their timber from? If they can't buy it in Australia, they buy it from overseas and there's probably more damage being done overseas than there is in Australia. So we felt a little safe like that, but it, it was a <coughs> another way we could earn income as the thing went on too by this sale of timber. Um, we had then solicitors draw up these contracts and they were, they were detailed. Uh, I just checked before I came away on this trip that the lease and sublease uh, contract was 22 pages long with a lot of legal, legal jargon in it. And the, <coughs> the buy or the contract of sale was 27 pages. So that's a fair bit of printing. <coughs> When we got those copies and, and had them signed by the, well, we, they were circulated to the Greenups and to us, and I went through them with a fine tooth comb because um, while I don't like legal language, I didn't want to sign something that I didn't understand. And, and I think it's very important that <coughs> when you come to do these things that you do understand the document. And if you can't understand what's written there, go find someone that'll help you do it because it is important because you need to rely on those things if there's any hiccups along the line. Um, once they were all signed, we did copies for our kids um, and gave them to them so they knew what was happening and to try and keep them in the loop. Um, so that once that was signed, we're off on it. And, um, and while things didn't all climb up the hill or go down the gully. Um, it, it worked, started to work pretty well. And, and some of the main advantages were um, that <coughs> by staging it like that, it allowed a steady wind back for Sally and I to change our lifestyle from what we'd been at for several decades. And it <coughs> also allowed the greenups to move in 
in a steady way. Um, and that was very advantageous because it was a big change. And it's always going to be a big change when, when you hand over a big deal of your life to someone else, whether it be your family, your sons or daughters, or outside investors or other, other partners. It is something that, that can be pretty confronting. So that stage deal allowed us to sort of move into it um, uh, <coughs> things. And, and I was um, allowed to sort of keep my involvement, especially while we had those trading stock there. I was very much involved in the day-to-day -day running of the stock and classing up of our stock and helping Rick with his. Um, it also let Sally ease back a bit. Uh, we had nice gardens around the homestead that Sally had spent all her married life looking after and there were um, those four separate residences while two of them were sort of half joined. Sally was looking after all those and she became very involved in that and, and part of her whole life. Uh, she always reckoned we had too many houses but she seemed to manage. Uh, <clears throat> and it allowed her to sort of come to grips with the fact that the garden always wasn't going to be hers but she looked after it right till the end and she looked after it as though she was going to take it with us um, which was beautiful and that that made our life a whole lot happier um, and Sally was also she'd done a lot of the book work for me um, she was able to wind back from that and um, from the stud work stud recording and also our just normal day-to-day -day accounting work and things and while I was sort of involved she did most of the hard paperwork on it uh, and while we, you know, they were leasing the land, um, we owned it still, so it was very important to us that it was looked after well. And at the end of that five years leasing period, uh, <coughs> the Greenups came to us, and we, we had been having fairly regular catch ups, and some of them were only going down to their place and having a, a half a day with them sitting around a table. Um, discussing it or they'd come up to us and and what have you but at the end of the and also we'd had a couple of meetings with some uh, excuse me business business advisors that they introduced to the deal and Sally and I felt very comfortable with them too they were astute people that had done a lot of these sort of things and given advice and uh, to other people and we found that very helpful because if any little hiccup started to come up they'd help us iron them out and, and try and find some middle ground so that, um, that both sides were happy. Uh, <coughs> um, and me being involved with the, the livestock and the pastures every day of the week, let's see, for the first several years, made it easy for me to keep an eye on things. But at the end of that five years, the Greenups, through these other facilitators, said, look, uh, we really aren't financially in a position that we can carry out the full contract of um, <clears throat> we know we've signed and if it push came to shove you can make us buy it all but we ask that you can we'll buy a section of it but can you let us lease for another couple of years and um, so yes we decided <clears throat> we've gone so far now we don't want it to stumble and go away with ill feeling because we'd force them to do something they weren't really feeling quite comfortable with. They had a young family and <coughs> fronting up to the fact that those kids had to go out of boarding school in the next several years. Um, so they bought um, perhaps our best block, which we'd have called, just to use the terminology, the crown and the jewel, which is, if I was in their position, that's the one I'd have been buying too, um, which is, you know, quite logical. And they came up with a hard cold cash for that, um, which meant then that that we could give our children a down payment on what was going to be theirs in the end and, um, and yeah, put round figures on it. We were able to give each of the kids a million dollars each, which wasn't a bad Christmas, Christmas present. I didn't ever get one except I inherited something <laughs> worth a little more than that. I had a good story about a friend of ours whose father was very wealthy and he, he was supposed to have written out a cheque for his sons at, uh, for Christmas for a million dollars quite a lot of years ago. And then he thought, oh, Jesus, I put, I have to put a stamp on that. No, I don't think so. And he tore, tore the checks up. 
<laughs> I think that story's been stretched a bit, but um, <laughs> um, the other thing that made it easier for us to ease out was Rick and Alice lived two hours drive away. You have to, you know, hunting it long, know where you're going for two hours, but <clears throat> they had their own properties down um, near Cumbia toward Kingaroy, and so they weren't living under our feet, as it were, at home. Rick had come up when he needed to. Um, he was using a lot of my staff for, for the first couple of years, and he'd bring some of his own staff up to do the mustering, and I was asked to go out and help with it. And um, there was certain change in style of that that sometimes used to rub up a bit the wrong way with me, but um, Sally kept telling me, no, you're coming back to me, Grizzly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not out there, you talk to them. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> we, Rick and I got on very well together. He has the same sort of management style in a way. Um, he may be a little rougher with stock than I am that used to get under my nostril a bit. But, um, uh, and I was, um, I did talk him into go to a low stress stock handling school after a while. <laughs> 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 I, as I went through life, I learned if, if you can get stock to work with you, Jesus, life's a lot easier. Um, when you're forcing them and you're pushing it, when we mustered a paddock, <coughs> he was always in a rush to get home. When we mustered a paddock, put the cattle in the yard, we all come down and, and maybe have an early lunch at 10 o'clock. But let the cattle settle, let the calves mother up again, so that, and you'd find that you'd get the afternoon's work done in less time than if you rushed it and fighting and kicking and all this. <laughs> anyway, um, but basically we had the same philosophy about running stock and um, uh, I was a very dedicated performance recorder. Um, I wanted to look after our land and hopefully be able to hand it on in a better state than when I was fortunate enough to get it. And um, <coughs> Also, um, not mind the place, um, just keep it easing along. And, and Rick, Rick and Alice both had that, um, that philosophy behind them. They were prepared to spell paddocks when they felt they needed it. In fact, they were probably a little more dedicated to doing that than I was. Um, but we, we did have low stocking rates all the time I was managing the property. And, and Rick and Alice, or well, Rick, he does the stock work, they don't push it too hard either, which um, and country will look after you if you look after it, we've found. And um, it gives you that little bit of freedom when times get tough, you have a bit more up your sleeve. Um, and that, that kept me f feeling that things were going along pretty smoothly. Um, <clears throat> there were differences that were going to come up, crop up. Um, nobody's the same, and, and they were looking on, um, looking on their enterprises slightly different from us. Uh, from us being Sally and I, um, <clears throat> and but I did have a thing in front of my desk that um, it was a little cutting I'd cut out of something saying, if you don't believe change is imminent, you're probably facing imminent extinction. <laughs> <laughs> and I, that's very pertinent because um, things do need to change. You need to change, especially if you bring in younger people they're going to have a different outlook on life. Their time frames are different. Um, so accept that the change will happen. It most often needs to happen. If your uh, enterprise is going to expand, change is going to be part of that. And um, it, the other thing was that um, if, if I felt a little bit disoriented in what was happening, uh, Rick and I had enough respect for one another. We'd sit down and talk about it. And if if it got a little bit, we'd get our wives in too. And so that things were sorted out, they didn't fester. And there's, you need to be able to go to sleep at night without worrying about, oh, you know, am I happy with this? And, um, and no matter if you have a tiff with your wife, make sure you always kiss her goodnight. <laughs>